So today we have Coral Clark from Sophia and Shellen Johnson, who was um, part of NITARP and also part of the Sophia Airborne Amb Astronomy Ambassadors. They're going to tell us about the Sophia program. Take it away, you guys. Excellent. Thank you so much, Felicia. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be part of Sophia's, NASA Sophia's uh, Education Public Outreach Program that is run out of NASA Ames in Northern California. Sophia flies out of Southern California in Palmdale at the day off. And um, we are going to present, just making sure everybody's on the same page about infrared astronomy and airborne observing and why that is a good choice. And then tell you a little bit about the program and what it can offer you as educators. We'll have time question and answer at the end. Uh, if there's any burning questions as we go, since it's such a small group, I'm I'm fine with going ahead and, uh, and jumping in um, with people would like. Uh, my name is Coral Clark. I'm one of the managers for the Airborne and County Ambassadors Program. And with me today is Shellen Johnson, who I'd like to introduce yourself now. Um, hi. Um, I was part of the NICAP program for four years, maybe. But um, I got the wonderful opportunity to fly aboard Sophia this in February. And um, I teach high school science in Minneapolis. Or it's snowing. <laughs> and, and it's not in California. Um, and yes, I didn't mention I actually have been in education for over 20 years. And I included 10 years, over 10 years in the classroom and 15 years of professional development experience. And, and truly, Sophia, working with Sophia, has been one of the most unique and rewarding. So just to make sure we're all on the same page here, I know that everyone does have uh, experience with the NICEP nice program, et cetera, but just well, as, as you well know, uh, we have, the full electric magnetic spectrum covers a huge range, and we only see a very small portion of this, and the rest is needs to be uh, detected by special equipment and detected that is not detected by our eyes. So, um, getting the whole picture, people who are used to looking up at the nighttime sky and are familiar with the entire electromagnetic spectrum only to see Orion and what you see on, on the left. But if you look at Orion with the infrared, it's a whole different view. Um, a lot of gas, a lot of dust, star forming regions, and information that just was not available in, in the solar event. So, I know that you have seen this image as a significant. This was actually special because uh, Orion was one of the targets that Shellen used, uh, that, that, that the telescope, like a service used when Shellen was in February. So it is a very popular uh, region to view, and, and you see this image a lot. But I, I wanted to connect it back to, uh, to something that was very familiar. And here is the single galaxy again. Uh, NASA is committed to making sure that we get the, the whole picture using as many different wavelengths as possible. So there are different missions specialized for different wavelengths. Chandra and extra Hubble is the optical. This for infrared and a lot of and plus wide and uh, other infrared observatories like Sophia to posit that image into uh, what more of what is really going on in terms of our current understanding, at least with the rest of the So there is a little bit of a problem in terms of getting those other types of wavelengths. You may have seen this image before as well, but again, just making sure we're um, recapping it on the same page. Radio waves do get down to the surface as well as from physical light. Many of the wavelengths um, are, uh, do not make it to the atmosphere. There are windows with certain types of or certain wavelengths that take it down further than others. Many need space telescopes to get a, a, a picture. There's this wonderful window here uh, where you get almost as good a view of being in space if you get above 99% of the water vapor in the atmosphere. And that is where airborne observatories really come in handy. Uh, one of the first NASA missions that did that did the infrared astronomy of building aircraft was the NASA Hyper Airborne Observatory, which flew out of NASA Ames at a 36-inch telescope. And it flew from 1975 to 1995. 
So uh, airborne observatories have an advantage of uh, coming home every night. They can be upgraded, fixed, cooled, and they do tend to last a significant amount of time during the big, big ocean. Um, if you fly above 40,000 feet, you can't get up to 45,000 feet. And Sophia is also the same thing. Now, uh, it flies the same, the same range. Now, I actually am very, very pleased that I got one of the last flights aboard the Airborne Air Air Observatory. And it truly was, um, it was a professional changing experience. It, it, uh, it, it was memorable beyond belief. Now, one of the type of Airborne Observatory's claims to fame is it discovered, uh, it was the observatory that was used to discover the rings around Uranus. And the principal investigator on that flight was Ted Dunham. And there's a special connection between Ted Dunham, the Piper Airborne Observatory, and Sophia. Sean, why don't you share this? Um, actually, uh, Ted Dunham was on was one of the principal investigators on the flight on which I was flying in February. But also, uh, a quick fun story is um, I went to a small liberal arts college in Minnesota. I was wearing a baseball hat from that college, and I just had the logo on the on my hat. He comes up to me and goes, oh, you're a dirty oak from St. Olaf, and he's from Carleton College, which is right across the railroad track. So it was kind of ironic that little teeny Northfield, Minnesota, uh, had, I mean, two people on the same flight, and neither one of us ever crossed paths. We're about the same age, so that was pretty cool. What a small world it is, meeting at 45,000 feet. <laughs> to see it. What are the odds? So yeah, the next yeah. generation from the Piper Airborne Observatory, it was so successful that they proposed to do a new NASA mission, uh, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, which is the CF, uh, needed to be heavily modified of up towards a 2.5 as opposed to an uh, almost meter telescope. A meter telescope needed a much larger plane. The fee is aboard a 747ST, heavily modified, of course. The telescope is in the back of the closest crisis that Kegler is going to very, very in the front. It has a 20 year lifetime again, so it will be able to come back, get refurbished, upgraded, fixed, etc., retooled uh, as needed. And we do have, it is a joint international endeavor between the General Space Agency, DLR, and the United States, which is a 20% percent relationship. So the German, uh, the German astronomers and astrophysicists do get some telescope time. And we also are able to fly anywhere. Uh, in, we are going to the Southern Hemisphere uh, for the first time to New Zealand and flying out of Christchurch in July of this year, which is very exciting. But I'm not going, but they may be bringing <laughs> uh, So this is an uh, close-up image of Sophia flying with its, with its door open. So of course, one of the challenges is making sure that the information gets to the telescope, giant light subject gathering the information. And it's, uh, it's very important to make sure that the airplane is set to fly with this gigantic hole in the side. Uh, this door opens and closes. It, it always kicks off and lands with the, the door closed. Whenever it's possible. They, they have done it with the door open because of safety, so they have the can, but it gets very dangerous to the telescope. So that's only an emergency situation. They did significant tests, if you can well imagine. Uh, to make sure that the plane is stable and there is not any sort of flux in the fuselage because that would limit the length of the mission and make the plane um, unsafe to fly earlier than anticipated. The engineering marvel that this is, I am always shocked at this. Uh, aboard the plane, the door opens and no one can tell during the entire time that it's opening, that it's fully open. The pilot can't tell there's no pull, no drag. Uh, it's it's uh, truly remarkable. This is about the size of a garage door, just to give you an idea of that. Now, um, people often say, well, if it's a giant hole in the plane, uh, isn't that a problem for the people uh, 
board would say get sucked out. There is a bullhead in between you and the mission counselor is able to pull. Are able to pull that for the mission. So this is just a recap of why Sophia is the spectral information of when we are on board Sophia as opposed to even Monacea, which is one of the uh, you, you're really getting a much better and clearer view. Not quite as good as space, but almost. So it, it uh, really is the best choice for many reasons. We also can go anywhere that we need to go. Uh, there's many different flights that have done an authorization, an authorization flight where uh, you need to be at exactly the right place at exactly the right time in order to do that or time it would go in front of a star. And uh, it's, it's tricky business. And you certainly, unless you've got really, really lucky, there's no way that this would happen with the ground basis with a choice. And so that is truly one of the advantages uh, that Sophia has. And we often come to be visible in terms of uh, physical observation for, for the contrary science for that. Uh, other areas of interest, galaxies in the Black Center. There was some exciting uh, research that was done last summer on the summer, actually two years ago, 2011, on the uh, black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Interstellar medium of the Milky Way, of course, with gas and dust in the star forming region. Other nurseries, the formation of stars and planets, which of course is very exciting. Um, the telescope is actually, uh, if you can imagine, this is another one of the challenges of not to the planet in the air without a lot of drag, but also the telescope itself is keeping it stable. Even above all points of the water vapor, you can look at turbulence, and therefore they needed to have some way of securing the, the telescope so it it is as stable as possible. This is used by floating the bit up on a spherical bearing. If, if anybody has been at Disneyland, probably have to Disney World too, there is a giant marble. I mean, it's four feet across, uh, made of solid stone. And it's floating on a uh, on water. And children go up and push this around on this, this water bearing. And the uh, telescope is, is on something similar, and it's also sent by down the of the orientation phase. It is so accurate that if you're pointing a laser at a dime, it could hold that target at a mile, a mile away from the dime. Shell, did you want to comment about how it felt to view the telescope from the inside? Uh, uh, sure. It, it was amazing. It, it, it looked like the telescope was moving, but it was actually the plane that was moving. So you, and you would never even feel it. It was the smoothest flight. It was the smoothest flight I've ever had in my entire life. And it was, that part was absolutely astonishing. Every time uh, we, the door would go up or the door would go down or we would change legs of the flight, you, you wouldn't know unless you were actually watching the bearing, not the bearing of the telescope, but the bearing, the heading of the, of the plane. And when you're inside the fuselage, you can put the uh, you actually can see the, the land the connection of the telescope, and it, it looks as though it's bouncing around, but it's actually, even though it's, it's light, the fuselage is bouncing around the, the telescope, and the telescope is remaining stable. So, uh, yeah, it's an amazing view. So, first four generation instruments, another uh, positive about being aboard an aircraft and having that aircraft come up is the instruments are going to be able to be upgraded and uh, implemented to make the to reflect the new technologies that are coming out over the 20 year lifespan of the mission. So we have uh, HIPPO flight cam great and forecast here, which is our, our, our first four instruments. We, we have five cameras and spectrometers. So as, as the technology uh, is improved, we can improve with it. And part of the flight this year has been instrument commissioning for the new instruments as well. And the plan for the mission is to have instruments 
a new instrument coming online every every year as we move forward into that uh, experiment. Experimental mode in terms of full scale operation. So this is a layout of the uh, the fuselage, and something I really like would like to point out here, which is we're very proud of, and it's very special look. So, so <laughs> the people with the fuselage are safe, and then the education and public outreach section. And this is this is very special. This is the first mission that had ever been proposed for NASA that had the education and public outreach component as a major component of the mission itself, and we're, we're very proud of that fact. So this is where the teachers, some of them would sit for the landing when they weren't at their education station. So at this point, I'm going to let you take a look at here and um, share some of your experiences. Okay. Um, quickly, the picture on the bottom is the mission director. Um, he controls, he or she, the person on the right is his assistant. Um, uh, they control everything. They can listen to all communications. So you can see all the multiple monitors that they will be using there. And they're in the, the, um, the flight suits. And the people above that, uh, those um, look like the, are those the data monkeys or the telescope operators? Those are the data monkeys. Yeah, the telescope operators. Oh, okay, sorry. The telescope operator. So they're just like in, in many major observatories, you have people who are responsible just for operating the telescopes, and then you would also have people that are responsible for reducing the data on the spot. So if you need to make a quick adjustment, you certainly could. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is the, the four of us who were flying on the two flights in February. Um, Vince and Ira, two gentlemen in the picture, um, are both from Southern California, and Connie Gartner is at the blonde, and I'm the one with the gray hair on the right. Um, we're from the upper Midwest, but this was part of the uh, Education Public Outreach Council that, uh, that we were looking at data right here. Um, and yes, uh, as part of this program, you do get one of those 50 white jackets. Very good at cocktail parties. Um, and this is a picture uh, from the uh, uh, data station looking at the telescope, the, kind of the center of the image is the telescope back there. And just to the left, the gentleman with the glasses, that's just Ted Dunham, the uh, Uranus guy. Uh, I don't think he probably uses his, the title of discovering rings around Uranus at, at cocktail parties, although that would probably be a good line. Um, but uh, that's funny, Gardner, who's finding um, for her students, she teaches, she's the curriculum director at a deaf school in Wisconsin. So it was really interesting to fly with her and to learn many new things, and I still, and I can't count to 10 yet in sign language, so I failed at that part. But um, you can see around Connie's uh, shoulder, she, next to the white shirt, yes, uh, that's called the EPO, that you have to carry your portable oxygen, emergency portable oxygen with you at all times. So it's kind of cool to see that part of it, um, as well as you know the actual flights and the science and what else. But the safety training that you go through, is, yeah, that was really interesting in as as well. So uh, next, please. These are just the different monitors and things that you see. So the top one is, is a lot. It reminds me a lot of EPC. So you're having the, the exact. Coordinates of where you're looking. Um, the picture with the uh, uh, circle near the middle, that's the, the vignette. You can see how much of the door is open, how much of the telescope is exposed. So, that, to me, that was a lot like APC or using DS9 or, or anything. You could take slices through things, you could do histograms, you could do many different things. And the image on the bottom is three, the three different cameras we were using. Uh, the uh, focal plane imager and the fine focal plane. Um, you can see the magnification, or the, sorry, the, the resolution is much better with the camera on the right versus the wide field on the left. So this is just what, what you would see on the monitors, and you can actually, um, you're not playing with the data, but you can actually uh, look at what the data is doing and what's happening at all times, which is really interesting to be able to see that. And then you, you uh, would able to be able to take these trip files back to the classroom 
decisions of third parties. That's not what we would consider someone who's eligible to their membership formula. But we do want to show that we, we feel that they have a significant, potentially a significant contribution. So if they are connected, they are part, they're potentially part of the team. And we do actually have two museums uh, in the for people who are involved in informal astronomy in the there is a call for proposals. It's a national program, and it goes through a rigorous um, process. There is a panel discussion uh, and, and, and panel discussion and um, a rubric that we follow to choose the, the, the team. There also, last time we went through this, was there were about five or six to one applications for each you know, each spot. We don't exactly, we haven't determined exactly how many spaces will be available for cycle two, but it will probably be similar to cycle one. And we are anticipating an even greater number of, of those proposals. They're chosen upon a variety of points, including the quality of the plan for the, their post-life impact, impact. So not only they have to not only acknowledge and from the point of how they will take this, their experience and implement, implement that into their their formal education program, but also how they can bring that information and experience, that inspiration and engagement to the general public of their community and also to other colleagues as well. Also, we do look at geographic and demographic diversity. This is a national program. We want to represent the rich fabric of the United States And then we would also continue that connection with your astronomy ambassador. If you're always an astronomy ambassador, and that that online community is going to, to grow. And we have a vision in, in 10 years where that could go and what that what we could get from potentially some longer study and meetings, et cetera, where we really need less of it. That potentially has a lot of effect. So, the first airborne astronomy ambassadors flew in 2011. Uh, they were a, a very specialized group. We had to we had a mandate from NASA headquarters to uh, to target very certain areas and people for very political and specific reasons, which made a lot of sense, and we did support that. Um, we got six wonderful educators, Maria Blessing and Krista Wolf. And then in the middle, we have Peggy Piper and Kathy uh, Fredette, who's our hometown girl. She lives in Palmdale and has since become an educator that specifically works with an aerospace charter school. We got that opportunity based on, on uh, what her experience with the CS. And then also, this is Terry uh, Burton, one of the of the investigators to the forecast team out of Cornell and we have Teresa Paulson and Maria Beard who are our final uh, investigative pilot program. And just just to pipe up, Krista Wolf is an alum of the program as is Peggy Piper and Teresa Paulson is participating this year. You guys get around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wonderful and we're thrilled to help, help promote Teresa's uh, NASA program. Uh, fantastic work that you're doing with that, and we want to make sure that that we are use our network to get the information out, so that as many wonderful qualified and permanent uh, educators can have this experience. Neil, there were also two German investigators that have flown as well. So there were eight as part of the pilot program, and so now there are 26 as part of the second one cohort. And four of those ambassadors have flown so far in cycle one. We, as uh, cycle one, has had uh, some challenges. They had to do a platform upgrade, which took a significantly longer amount of time than anticipated. Um, however, we are flying again. Everything is looking great. We will be doing flying starts coming up in June. That more ambassadors are flying on, as I mentioned, we have a 16 minutes schedule. 
slides issued, and then the remainder would finish up in the October uh, of this uh, campaign. Sorry. And the, these are astronomers. These are just the type of ones. You can see they represent a very um, large array of experiences. We have one from Hawaii, and, and then the rest are from the mainland. Yeah, very strong, strong uh, educators that I'm, I'm really proud to have attended with us. Show one last thought. Um, here you can just see this is the four of us in front of the telescope. So you can see that uh, the the uh, how large the telescope actually is uh, in relation to like humans. Um, but uh, it was a fabulous uh, experience to be able to fly. And, uh, Sophia and work with the Germans uh, with the focal plane imager, the cameras which we are using. Uh, it was really fun to work with Coral and Pamela, the two outreach personnel. But it, it really enhanced my night prep experience. I mean, night prep taught me a ton about infrared astronomy and this, um, this augmented that experience. It was a really uh, worthwhile thing, but also I. I on a plug night time, obviously everybody knows how, how wonderful of experience that is as well. So that's about it. And so just to recap a couple of things, we do have now have open applications for cycle two. The deadline of that is May third, that is coming up. And again the educators you do need to have the application in team of two. We do not recruit potential partners for you very necessary that you really think about who you'd want to work with to implement that education and outreach plan and do your application together. PhDs, this cohort for cycle two will be flying during 20 flights during calendar year 2014. There's more information to including FAQs and also uh, the application is an online application and it is available at study.org slash the CF. If you have more in more questions, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, with my email address right here, it's Mark at UFR.edu. And then if you have more questions about the flight of experience from the investors perspective, Shellen has offered to be a contact for that and allow me to allow us to look for her email address here. And at this point I'd like to open it up for other types of questions regarding the experience for the Airborne Astronomy Ambassadors program on Sophia. Okay, Louisa, I guess there are no specific questions. If you saw any holes or <laughs> corrections in, in what I said, I, I welcome your your input. No, I, I think it sounded great. I thought, yeah, I, I didn't know some of the things that you were talking about, so this is good. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much for this opportunity. We really yes. do appreciate it. Thank you so very much. We look forward to continue uh, working with your programs as a uh, to help increase the, the, uh, the visibility of both programs. Yep, absolutely. So if thank you, I, I want to say thank you for putting on the tutorial. I found it very helpful. But this is that. So I appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you. So I have to really appreciate your enthusiasm. Thanks. Can I ask you something? Good luck, good luck Beth. <laughs> Pardon me? I was wondering if you were planning on applying. Yes. I mean, I have a, a colleague, and we've been working on the application, and we were, um, well, we're just a little bit unsure about, do, do we need to have um, a, a research project in mind when when we go into this, or do, or do they just kind of match us up with someone? Should we, like, uh, in the, you know, the other information, should we be telling them, like, um, areas of interest, or is that kind of just left up to how people are assigned? Well, that's an excellent question. And we we don't know what the targets are going to be because the the investigators have not called yet. So their, their application is about the same time. They haven't been chosen. We don't know what the targets are going to be that will happen later. So what the education and public outreach portion of the application needs to include is general, we're going to take this information and 
use it in our classrooms by give us an example of how you would incorporate it, that into your curricula. And then how it, maybe there's a there's a certain project that you would have at school for star parties, certain presentations that you have uh, for other educators that you would want to say that would be the the public outreach portion and the uh, curriculum training that you would do and you would bring to your college. So yes, you do need to have some specific idea of how you're going to use the information, but you don't need to tell the information because it, it could be anything. Okay. So we also recognize that after your experience, your original plan may completely change. And we welcome that opportunity to reflect on the experience and then modify your education and outreach plan accordingly. I think it's worth, particularly for the NITARP crew, emphasizing exactly that, that you don't have to have a science idea going in, you have to have a really good education plan going in. Because the NITARP folks are used to writing science proposals, this is not the same thing. Right? Yes. Thank you. And not only is it not the same thing, to just to be very clear, you do not get telescope time. You do not get to speak to the investigators and say, oh, could you look at this target? That is actually not part of that. So we can do the best that we can if you're specifically interested in like star forming regions or something like that. If it is possible to connect you with one of the investigators doing that research, we will. Uh, it, 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 we don't know what the time is. But it, yes, it's, okay. not, it's not quite the same thing in the sense of, um, it, you won't be working with the data that were obtained during your flight necessarily. I see. Okay. Right. Because and part of that is the mechanics of it, right? Because I have Science Sophia data from the very first Science General Observers call, and because they are still debugging things, the data are not all that easy to work with. So I think give them some time. Uh, and then maybe eventually you'll be able to work with the SOFIA data. But right now, <laughs> it's it it's hard even for the sci the professional astronomers involved. Okay, well that really clears up. But you know, if we were a little confused about um, do we you know do we have to have a science idea? Is it, you know, the educational ideas is you know basically right up our alley. We can do that, but we weren't we weren't real sure about the science part of it and how that would work. Right. But, so yeah, thank you so much for that clarification, Lisa. And if you have questions about by mm -hmm. on, you can feel free to contact. In, thank you. Send me an email. I can send you my phone number. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Are there any more questions or discussion points? I just encourage uh, if you're interested to apply. Absolutely. You know, give it a shot. So it, it was a uh, uh, fabulous. Fabulous uh, week out in Palmdale. It sounds wonderful. I hope, I hope we get it too. <laughs> I hope so too. Good luck. I, I you know, persevere and get the application done. It's not, it's not overly long. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool.